it's no shock to us that, that marriages are in trouble across our country. Now, there are a lot of, a lot of factors that play into this. Uh, the redefinition of marriage that uh, government officials and the state has, has given, uh, marriage is in, in, is in trouble. I, I could roll out a lot of statistics that show the decay of marriages uh, like now compared to maybe a decade or, or two decades ago. Uh, growing up, I heard all kinds of statistics about the trouble that marriages were in and and the statistics that were given then pale in comparison to the trouble that we see in marriages and in the institution of, of marriage today. Now, I could, I could lay out a bunch of statistics, but I think that all of us have an idea that, that marriage is in trouble. And, you know, I would, I would venture to say that, that simply hearing this brings up or draws up a pit in our stomach. Because all of us, all of us have been affected directly or indirectly by, by broken marriages, by broken relationships. All of us have experienced painful, life-altering sadness. And sometimes when even the word marriage is brought up because of what you've experienced in, in your relationship or in your families, boy... <sighs> There's just a, a pit that rises in your stomach. Over the past few months, we've been working through the book of Ephesians in kind of a zigzag pattern. We've gone from chapter 1 to chapter 4, back to chapter 3, and today we're going to land in 11 verses in chapter 5. And so if you have your Bibles, would you turn to Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to look at, at verses 21 to 32. These verses talk about what a godly biblical marriage should look like. Now today, as, as we look at these 11 verses, I believe that, that we will see the beauty of our relationship with Jesus through the illustration of, of marriage, through the, the word picture of marriage that, that Paul uses. I want us to, to read through uh, I'm going to read through all 11 verses because it's important that, that we hear these verses in their big context uh, rather than taking a verse here and there and, and maybe misreading them or taking them out of context. And so when we, when we look at Ephesians 5, 21 through 32, the broad context is, is Ephesians 5.1. Now, I know I've thrown out a lot of verses there for you to try to jump around and figure. But if you land on Ephesians 5.21, you'll, you'll be good this morning. The big context is in Ephesians 5.1, which says, Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love. And so that's the context for the verses I'm about to read in Ephesians 5.21. In the context of Jesus giving himself sacrificially for you and me as a, as a fragrant offering. So Ephesians 5.21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her, the church, holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blame, any other blemish, but holy and blameless. This Paul is describing here a, a sacrificial love, the sacrificial love that Christ uh, displayed for you and me. Verse 28. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are all members of his body. This is, this is talking about all believers. This is talking about the church. 
We are all members of one body. For this reason, verse 31, as we think about this picture of Christ's relationship with the church in the context of marriage, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Now, this is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now, Scripture, in the broad context of Ephesians chapter 5, calls us to be in mutual submission to one another, all of us, mutual submission to one another for the sake of out of reverence for Christ. Now, we submit to each other, not because we always want to, but because we desire to honor Jesus through our relationships with each other. Submission can be a really hard word, can't it? My guess is that if, if marriage brought up a pit in your stomach, you hear the word submission, just make that pit a little bit bigger. And, and all of us, though, are, are called to submit. Paul uses the word submission 23 times in his letters to churches and to his friends. Sometimes it's in the context of submitting ourselves fully to the Lordship of Christ. Sometimes it's in the context of submitting to civil authorities. Sometimes it's submitting to church leaders. Other times it's submitting to employers or masters. Sometimes it's submitting to parents. In this context, though, in, in these 11 verses, the example of submission and love is in the context of marriage. Now, before we jump into the heart, the heart of the passage, it's probably helpful that I say a few things. I'm going to address several different groups that have gathered today and those that are watching on Facebook. But, but let me speak, first of all, to husbands. You might be thinking, husbands, well, I'm not a wife, so several of these 11 verses, they don't apply to me. Wives, you might be thinking, well, I'm not a husband. Several of these verses don't apply to me. And if you're single, you might say, well, I'm not a husband or a wife, so most of these verses don't apply to me. So let me, let me kind of set that straight, because as I've read these verses, I've had to set it straight in, in my own life. Husbands, all the godly principles in these passages, in these verses, apply to you. Did you get that? Husbands, all of the godly principles apply to you. Wives, all of the godly principles in these verses apply to you. And folks that are, are single, all of the godly principles in these verses apply to you as well. Now, these, these verses are, are primarily about our relationship with Jesus and about our relationship with one another. The marriage relationship is just one of the pictures that we find in Scripture about Christ's relationship to his church. The context here is, is marriage, but there are principles that, that span whatever relationship you might be in. We're called, and I'm going to put these principles on the screen and they'll, they'll remain up there, so that there'll be a point of reference as we talk through specific people groups. And in the, the big context, the, the, uh, the principles that we find in this passage is that we are to submit mutually to one another. The first is that we're to submit to one another. The second is that we are to love one another the way that Christ has loved us or loved the church. And the third principle we see is that Jesus' relationship with the church is a model for marriage. We're to submit, we're to love, and we're to, to recognize or see that this is a picture of our relationship with Christ, marriage. So again, let, let's, let's go through these verses. Verse 21 is to everybody, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Okay, wives, let me, let me talk to you. And, and husbands, listen in because these principles apply to us as well. Wives, submit to your own husbands as you would to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. 
Now the church submits, that's us, the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Now in, in religious systems, back in the first century and many religious systems today, excluding Christianity, wives are seen and were seen as property or as a commodity. Husbands demanded submission and respect from their wives out of a sense of superiority, and that's wrong. There are lots of problems with that way of thinking. A relationship that demands submission or demands respect is inconsistent with the way of Jesus, inconsistent with the pattern that we see in the New Testament. Anyone who, who demands submission, they may get compliance, but the heart will not submit. Anyone who demands respect may get lip service, but the heart won't follow. Now, this is what this, these verses are not saying. Sometimes to, to define what a verse or a passage is saying, we have to identify what it's not saying. This verse, a set of verses, is not saying that men and women are unequal. Make sure that you hear me in that. This passage is not saying that men and women are unequal. The way of Jesus declares that through faith in him, all of us, male or female, have an equal standing and have equal access and, and equal value in the eyes of God through faith in Christ. Galatians 3.28 tells us, prior to faith in Christ, you and I were fragmented. We were at war with one another and all of us were separated from God. We, we saw that in Ephesians chapter 2. And through faith in Christ, you and I, whether Jew or Gentile or slave or free or high on the economic status or low on the economic scale, whether we're male or female, we are united in Christ. We have an equal footing when it comes to our salvation and our relationship with God. Here's another thing that this passage is not saying. And wives, ladies, it's important that you hear this. This passage is not saying that women should be a doormat or remain in a place of abuse. That's not consistent with the way of Christ. Jesus lifted up the condition of women. He protected their dignity and included them in, in, in commissioning them to tell his story to other people. Jesus was a great uh, um, advocate for the value and the place of women. The context here in this message is to believers in the context of a godly marriage, a marriage where respect takes place, where a husband is caring for the needs of his wife. The expectation in, in this context is that the motivation for submission is to release a place of a preeminence or self superiority and to embrace the way of Christ. This is embracing the person of Jesus as in, in relying on the person of the Holy Spirit to accomplish this in our lives as we entrust ourselves to the will of God the Father. Okay, guys, this is important for us to hear in, in these verses that speak directly to wives. Guys, it is important that we know that these verses are not a license or an excuse to abuse. It's calling us to the polar opposite of that. When we, when we read on the instruction of, uh, of Scripture for guys, you, you see the verse, the verse 23, where, where it says, the husband is the head of the wife. Now, when we take the word submit and the phrase, the husband is the head of the wife, you and I know that over the years, these two things have been misused to justify the idea that husbands are dominant and that their wife has, uh, has a lesser ability or is less than able to think or make decisions or to discern the will of God. This is a misapplication of this passage. This is not the way that God views women or wives. Now the word head here, uh, I could throw out the Greek word, but we would all forget it in just a few minutes. But this word describes a number of things. 
When scripture says that the husband is the head of the wife, this word head is, is used to describe the capstone of a building, the header or the beam of a doorway, or the headwaters of a stream, the beginning point, the place where water springs out of the ground to provide life-giving qualities to those downstream. The idea of the husband being the head of the wife has a huge responsibility on us as guys. We are called to be stable and reliable. We are called to support and to provide for our wife's needs. Now up until the, the middle of the last century, as this passage was read, folks would have no problem with the idea that, that wives should submit to their husbands. It was, well, they may have had a problem, but there was a, 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 a social understanding of, of what that might look like. Now, since, uh, since the mid part of the last century, so many different changes have taken place. Up until that point, guys made up the, the majority of the workforce. And there was an opening of opportunities during that time for, for women and for wives to, to enter into the workforce. And all of us have benefited from that. And so when we see this passage, uh, initially, we, we may not understand what it means, and so we have to step back into the first century context to say, oh, okay, I understand. In that context, the husband provided primarily protection and, and provision for the family, and that the role of the wife there was to submit for her own good so that she would have access to the source of protection and provision. Now, God's word hasn't changed but our context has changed somewhat. And so we, we have to know that in that act of submission, there is a huge responsibility for us as guys to care for and to love our wives and submit to them for their sake and for the sake of Christ. All of us are to be mutually submissive. Now remember the context of this passage. Submit to one another. Love one another the way that Christ loved us and see this marriage relationship as a picture of Christ's relationship with the church. Scripture says, ladies, submit to your husbands. And boy, guys, we are called to love our wives sacrificially. If I am ever in a place where I have to demand submission from Meg, then I'm probably not loving her right or consistently over time. As we were driving yesterday and I was thinking about this, I, I said, uh, hey Meg, have I ever demanded that you submit to me? And boy, I was scared to ask that because I, my memory isn't always that great. And she said, uh, no, and I'm going with that. I, and, and guys, if, if we want to live in a peaceful relationship with our spouse, we have to love them consistently the way that Christ loved the church. Now, some guys have taken verses 22, 23, and 24 out of context and used them as a license to, to dominate, and they totally neglected the following verses. And so, husbands, I, I'm speaking to you right now. Guys, I'm speaking to you. Husbands, we are called to love our wives completely and sacrificially. And the next few verses, 25 through 30, they neuter any idea that guys have the right to abuse or dominate women. Look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her, the church, holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Now, this kind of sacrificial love cost Jesus everything. It cost him his life. In verse 28, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own body. For he who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. Guys, the standard that we are called to is one of love and sacrifice. 
Loving our wife is an act of submitting to Christ as we submit ourselves to meeting our wife's deepest needs. Did you hear that? Loving our wife is an act of submitting to Christ as we submit to ourselves to meet her deepest needs. Verse 29 gives this example. And I, I think all of us can relate to this with our own bodies. We care for our body. We feed our body. And guys, we are called to feed, to nourish the relationship that we have with our wife and to care for her. And the word care here means to cherish and comfort. It's not simply putting food on the table, but it's listening to and caring for her every need. Guys, we are called to be sensitive to our wife's physical and emotional needs. We're, we're called to pay attention to her. Guys, the, the expectation is that the motivation for this kind of love is to let go of our sense of preeminence or our sense of superiority and to embrace the way of Jesus. This is embracing the person of Christ. It is relying on the power of the Holy Spirit to accomplish this in us and to entrust ourselves to the will and the purpose of God the Father for us. Now, sometimes the temptation I'll speak for myself, but I'm projecting this on you other guys. Sometimes our temptation, especially early in a growing marriage, is to prove ourselves as the protector and the provider. Now, early on in this season of marriage, I too wanted to show Meg that in everything I did, I held her best interest, even if she didn't agree with what I was thinking. That, that I, as, as the husband... I, I kind of knew what we were supposed to do, and I didn't always listen to her. So this is 30 years ago, so I'm safe to talk about it now, right? So Meg and I had been married for about three years when, when I decided that it was time for me to sell my 1974 Chevy Chevette. Now, I wanted to sell it so that I could buy a four-door Honda Accord because I felt like that would be a better family, a uh, better car for us. As, as we were thinking about having a family. Now, we had purchased the Chevy Chevette for $150. And it was so cheap for us because we bought it from a police chief in a small town. He had purchased it for his daughter and it had been in a number of accidents. It had reflective tape all around the car so no one would hit it again. The body of the car had been eaten away by the salt of this small Minnesota town. And because of the salt and the rust and all the accidents it had been in, whenever you shut the driver's side or the passenger door too hard, you could hear glass rattle down and fall out on the ground around the car. Now, I knew that it was time to get rid of this thing and buy a used Honda Accord. I was sure it was the best decision. It was the safe decision. It was the right decision so that I could show my wife that I wanted to protect her and provide for her. But Meg wasn't convinced. In fact, she was kind of adamant that this was the wrong decision. And I listened and I thought, you know, I'm going to take what you've said. And, but boy, I, I know the right decision for us. And so against her advice, we bought the Honda Accord. And I was sure it was the right decision, the right thing to do. Because God had placed me in a position to make decisions for our family. Well, just a few short weeks later, there was a cold snap. Uh, by that time, we were living in Colorado, and there was a cold snap, and I was driving up to Denver, and suddenly the engine seized because the radiator had frozen. Now, we had to let it sit in the shop for several weeks before we could uh, gather together enough money to put a new engine in this great used car. And I was still convinced that I, I had made the right decision. Once it was fixed, I, I had it for a couple of weeks, and the transmission went out. And again, it had to sit in the shop for weeks. But that was okay. I, I made the right decision. And then there was a severe hailstorm that rolled in and pitted the entire car. And then while driving 
on the highway, a tire that had come off a truck bounced into the windshield and smashed it. But it was all good. I had made the right decisions. Once the repairs had been complete, and by this time, several months had passed, and we were now living in, in Hook River, Oregon, I was at a new job with this great car that was brand new, it seemed, new engine, new transmission, new windshield, new bodywork, this great new car, and I pulled in after lunch and uh, parked and went into where my office was. I sat down at my desk and I was about ready to tackle the afternoon when I heard this loud banging on the front door of the church. And I ran to see who it was, and it was the postman, the postal worker. And, and they said, hey, do you have a gray car? And I said, yeah, the one that's parked right out here. And he went, <laughs> it's not there now. And I think that I had forgotten to set the parking brake. And it rolled across the parking lot and through the neighbor's fence. And at that point, I was convinced Meg had been right all along. <laughs> I was convinced that I was wrong and she was right and God had no problem of consistently letting me know. It is so important for us to listen to each other because none of us have a corner on God's will. We are called to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ because we are members of of his body and he uses all of us to shape us and move us in the direction that God wants us to go guys we have to be sacrificial and caring and supportive and selfless and to look out for the interest of our wife and the interest of others but this means we must always listen we must always hear what God is saying through our wife and through the people around us. In this whole thing, I also asked Meg last night, I said, I said, you know, do you remember the details of all of that? Yeah, I remember. And I said, I really appreciate the fact that in all of that, all the months that that was unfolding, you never said, I told you so. She simply entrusted the situation to God and let him work out the details and the circumstances to teach me what I needed to know. Wives, scripture says, submit and respect your husband. But husbands, boy, we are called to love. We are called to give ourselves up for our wife's wife sacrificially, do everything we can for her good, and to submit ourselves to her needs. Guys, we're not immune from the responsibility that we have to submit ourselves fully to the Lord and to listen to our spouse. Ladies, you are not immune from the responsibility to love. Even though in this passage it never says, wives, love your husbands, you're not immune. We are called to submit to each other and to love one another because loving and submitting to one another. To to oh, wow, my watch just talked to me. Submitting and loving one another is the better way of Christ. Then look at the picture that Paul uses to describe the bond that Jesus has with us as the church. The picture that he uses to illustrate the depth of relationship that he has with us. Verse 31. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And here, Paul is quoting Jesus, and Jesus is quoting what is written in Genesis 2, that a man will leave his father or mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Paul says this is a profound mystery. This is the greatest of all mysteries that I'm talking about Christ in the church. However, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Marriage. Marriage is the living, the visible picture of Christ's relationship with the church. Church, we are called to submit to one another. We are called to love one another the way that Christ loved us. And we are called to pay attention to this picture because the picture of marriage is an illustration of Christ's 
relationship with us. What do you need to do this morning with the things that you've seen in Scripture? What do you need to do with the things that you've heard this morning? What changes do you need to make in your relationships with the people around you? What confessions do you need to make before the Lord? Boy, as I've walked through this passage, there have been so many sentence confessions to the Lord. So many things that he's reminded me of where I've had to say, Jesus, I am sorry for that. I've had to say, Meg, I, 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 I'm sorry for how I treated you in, in this situation. And there might be places or circumstances where confession needs to take place in your life as well. What apologies do you need to offer? How do you need to receive the Holy Spirit's empowerment to live differently? Because friends, it is not always easy to submit to each other. It is not always easy to love. And it's easy to forget the depth of love that Christ has shown to you and me when he gave himself sacrificially for us. And we need the Holy Spirit's empowerment to live differently for the sake of Christ. Jesus, on this day when we continue to be separated from one another because of the virus and restrictions, it's easy to forget that all of us who have placed our faith and trust in you are one as the body of Christ. Thank you for giving us this picture from life of the love that you've shown toward us. And Father, I, I, play, I pray your blessing over the marriages in this church and the marriages of those who are listening and ask that, that you would help us to live out these relationships in a way that's worthy of your word, that's worthy of the relationship that we have with you. And Father, there, there are people here that have not or who are not currently experiencing a marriage relationship. And Jesus, would you provide a huge layer of, of comfort for them if they grieve this in their life. That Jesus, you would help them to see that you have provided a deep and a lasting relationship with your Father as they place their faith in you. And I, I know, Jesus, that, that talking about these things can stir up all kinds of stuff in our lives. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would settle our hearts in our lives, that you would descend in a fresh way over us, and that Jesus, you would help us to focus on the love that you have for us as we live in submission to your word and submission to your way. In Jesus' name, amen.